A cute little girl was sitting on a pile of luggage in a hotel lobby while her parents were at the desk checking in a room. And the sympathetic lady saw this little girl and she asked the little girl if they were visiting relatives in the city. Oh no, oh no, the little girl replied. He said, we are going to live at this hotel until we find a house. My daddy has a new job, so we had to sell our house and move. The lady said, oh, that's too bad. You don't have a home. To which the girl replied, oh, we have a home. It's just that we don't have a house to put it in. A contractor can build your house, but only you can make a home. The songwriter wrote John Payne many years ago, amid pleasures and palaces, though we may roam, be it ever so humble, there's no place like home. Our session this morning is on having a godly home. Edgar Guest wrote, it takes a heap, heap of living to make a house a home. And it certainly does. Our text is in Joshua chapter 24, verse 15. As we examine having a godly home, and we've been discussing that over the last couple of days, and we want to look at this passage this morning. Joshua 24, 15. If it's disagreeable in your sight to serve the Lord, choose for yourself today whom you will serve. Joshua said this to the Israelite people. He stood out amongst all of them, and he said, you need to determine if you're going to serve the Lord or not, whether the God which your fathers served, which were beyond the river, or the Lord or gods of the Amorites, in whose land you're living. But he said, as for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. And God's dealing with Noah and Abraham later on with Israel in the Passover and at Mount Sinai. We repeatedly see the deep meaning of the united mention of, of parents and children in the Lord's commands and promises. We read over and over in the Old Testament of you and your house, you and your seed, you and your children. And in the words of Joshua, we have a response from earth that says, as for me and my house, I will do that. So here we have a principle that the parent boldly vouches for his whole family and for himself. And so that's what family Christianity is, ought to be. First thing we'll look at, let it be a personal faith. Joshua, before a throng of people, <coughs> stood out on a platform and he said, this is the way it's going to be. And if you choose not to, that's fine. But I'm speaking for my family today. For me and my house, that's the way it's going to be. It's a personal faith. He said, ask for me and my house. He began with himself. For the a godly home, the first and most essential ingredient is personal consecration. And it's good to be concerned about the physical needs, the social needs, but the first thing on the part of the parent is a life devoted to God and His service. And there must be no hesitation, no half-heartedness in, uh, in the consciousness of the confession of the devotion of God's service is to be clear. That's where we stand. And we're not moving from standing there. As infinite love, God lives not for Himself alone even, but finds His blessing in imparting His own life to us. We impart that life to others as well. In the home on earth, in the love of a husband and wife, a parent, a child, uh, we are to be reflected, the, there is to be reflected the love and blessedness of the Father's home in heaven. And so the deepest secrets of the Godhead in the fellowship of the Father and of the Son, the Holy Spirit, were to be shown in the family. It's to be exhibited by the family day in and day out. And fathers and mothers should lead a life marked by love to God and man so the children will see that example. Sixth thing, next thing I think we find in this passage, it must be a family faith. First he said for as for me, then he added his family and my house. 
So it was not just for him, it was for his home as well. We will serve the Lord. Many parents who love God don't see to it that their children are directed in the same way. They seem to let them, let them make up their mind for their own self without any instruction, without any guidance, without any encouragement to have the same belief and, and, uh, and, and in the sight of God. They think that uh, salvation and service of their children is dependent on God's will apart from them and their, in, and their instruction to their children. I'm reminded of what the wife uh, of Manoah, if you know the story of Samson back in Judges, an angel appeared to her and said, you're going to have a son. Uh, he's going to be this type of person. We know the story of Samson. And, uh, and when Manoah, her husband, he was not there when the angel appeared. When she went back and told him, Manoah the dad said, he said, I need to see this angel again. I need to hear this. And he said this. Manoah said, now when your words come true, he's speaking to God. He said, what is to be the child's manner of life, and what is his mission? You see, Manoah was concerned. You're sending this child. His name is Samson. He didn't get to hear the first message. He said, tell me, please, Lord, what I am to do to raise such a child. What am I to do? To How am I to bring him up? What is to be his manner of life? What is to be his mission? And God has set that for us today for our homes and families. You know, education consists not so much of what we do or say, but most of what we are and what they see, more than what we say. And many parents are so occupied, they're occupied with their job, they have a business, they have recreation, they have other things that they cannot find time for speaking out and making uh, sure the decision is made. We will serve the Lord. So first we see here that Joshua said, me, he said, now I'm going to speak on behalf of my family. Uh, many times men leave the training of this to, to their wives. But we need to take it on ourselves to say this is going to be what we do in this whole family. So if you're even a single parent, I remember the education of Moses' uh, mother who did not, he only had him, uh, he did not have a father. Moses' mother gave her son such instruction during the years of his childhood that was such of a manner that when he got to Pharaoh's court, it could not be obliterated. It was ingrained in him. He'd been taught this from a child. He'd been instructed this way, and when he faced a very difficult situation, he would not back down. He said he was saying, this is where we stand. So train your child for God. Uh, and his people to, when it comes time, they, your children have to go out into the world that they will be safe in the power of faith and of God's keeping in their lives. That's what we have the privilege of doing, is sending them out uh, and, and trained, uh, focused on the right direction, knowing how to live, and have to trust God and help them to can, continue that when they're out of our home. Christ must be the first and foremost in our own soul. Then we must be in fellowship. Then we can be in fellowship with our mate and children. The next thing about this passage in Joshua chapter 24, it needs to be a practical faith. He said, we will serve. First he said, as for me. Then he said, as for my house. And then we see it was a practical faith because he said, we will serve the Lord. We'll not just be in name only. I will not just take this lightly. But we're going to serve the Lord. Now there's many parents with whom the whole of Christianity consists of salvation, but not service. They're happy as long as their kids come to know the Lord, but we want more than that. We want them to serve the Lord and be involved in their daily lives uh, in the Word of God. And they pray their children might be saved, but they care a little whether they serve the Lord or not. Notice what he said. Joshua said, I don't know how I'm going to teach them how to serve the Lord. I'm going to set the example. It wasn't just for me. It was for them uh, to, to, to come to know the Lord and then how to help them to know how to serve the Lord. 
So we train up the next generation of people to know how to serve the Lord and carry that out. And they pray, like I said, that their children would come to Christ but not really do anything to help them. Genesis 18, 19, this is what God said to Abraham. He said, for I know him that he will command his children and his household after him, and they shall keep the way of the Lord to do justice and judgment. You imagine being such a man that God could say about him, I know him. I know how he will live. I know how he will respond. I'll see the consistency in his life. It's not saying one thing and doing something else. He said they need to see the consistency of our lives. Our homes do. Our children do. And, and Abraham was such a person that God says, I can tell you, and he said this different times about different people. He said it about Moses. He, he, he said it to Abraham. He said, I know him. He'll take this seriously. He will fulfill this. He will keep the way of the Lord. He will do justice and judgment. As I said, Moses and the same connection uh, with the, his, Israel's deliverance from Egypt. He said, let my people go that they may serve me. Not just know biblically, not just have heard, <coughs> but they will also actively be involved in serving. And Pharaoh said, when Moses told Pharaoh that, he said, let my people go so they can go out and not just be a body of believers here, but they may be able to serve me. And Pharaoh said, go, serve the Lord. <coughs> let your little ones also go with you. I said, it takes backbone. And the world has seen enough of uh, Millie Mouth Christians and people who claim to believe a certain way and have certain convictions and have certain standards. They need to see somebody that's going to say, yes, that's the way it's going to be. And we're not changing from that plumb line. <coughs> plumb line is referred to in the Bible in Amos, it's referred to in Zechariah, it's referred to uh, in Haggai, uh, over time that you, you fulfill the purpose that God has for you, and it's a straight line that if you build a building, you know how that works to keep it straight. He said, these people, these people will fulfill this goal, and this command of God to go out and be what God would have been. Even the enemies, Pharaoh, he said, well, go then. Uh, you want to get rid of them and your little ones with you. What if he hadn't taken a stand? What if he had just many mouthed around? You see, all redemption is for service. God called us to put the conviction in our hearts to bring us to him. Now he says, I want you to serve me. And God gives us all gifts, certain spiritual gifts, in some way we can serve him. So it's not just about knowing him. That's the first step. And God's will is not that he should be worshipped without being served. Next thing. It was a confessed faith. Before tens of thousands of people, in the presence of all the children of Israel throughout that land, Joshua said, Choose you this day whom you will serve. And as for me, my house, we will serve. It was confessed faith. It was the secret faith. It wasn't something he kept hidden uh, or timid about. It was confessed. And what he believed was not the religion of his day. It was contrary to what his neighbors believed. He had to stand against all of that. And uh, he said everybody else might reject God, yet he would serve the Lord. And around the world, people are having to do that. Uh, for the last uh, 16 years after I was a pastor, I've traveled to 25 countries, primarily in the Middle East, and Muslim countries, and other countries like that. And I've seen people meet who took that same stand. I know people who have been killed uh, for their stand of trusting Christ and following Him. I've met in homes, apartments, where they met in secret. Uh, you would, it would be an apartment building, you walk in, a few people come in, not a whole lot of people get in there, so it's not obvious to neighbors. But then once we got inside there, I'd speak to them, 
as they sat around the table. And they always wanted to eat over there, so they always had to eat something there while we were there. But to see the faith and the confidence and the trust in God uh, is uh, humbling, to say indeed, under a great duress, uh, the difficulties that they have, that they serve the Lord, and that's what God is saying to us. It is confessed faith. And uh, and what he believed was, as I said, might be contrary to what everybody else believed. And our homes then should be a blessing to other people. Our homes should be totally dedicated to Christ. And our greatest gift you can give your children is a Christian father or mother. It's not money. It's not things. It's not this, it's not that. The greatest gift you can give them is a Christian father and mother, a godly influence and memory. Not that you were a good golfer or a bowler or a gardener or a fisherman, but that you were a godly father and mother. It made no difference to me what we had uh, as a child on a farm in Oklahoma. I knew I had a godly dad and mother, and that made all the difference in the world. I have uh, four brothers, I have five sons, all we had in our family, and I had five sons. My youngest son has four sons today, he's trying to keep the thing going <laughs> here with them. His wife said she's ending at four. <laughs> uh, he likes the contest, he wants to have just as many as the rest of them did, so far it's not working that way, but uh, we find that one of the most common cases of emotionally disturbed people today is the average American and my heart goes out why me why did I get to grow up in the home I did people might have driven by that farmhouse and thought we were all poverty stricken we had something in there that lasted. All my brothers came to know Christ as their Savior. You couldn't exchange that for anything. You see, God has a different plan for you. It costs you much. Not trying to harm you, trying to help you. If we'll follow his plan, we can have a home that honors the Lord and is a blessing to other people around us. Instead of expecting security in our homes today, many of them build, uh, instead of having parents or building a love relationship and uh, the right kind of home, children do often see and feel the trauma of hostility and hatred animosity between two people they love the most, their father and father and mother. And from the hostility, the children develop emotional insecurities and they have fears that follow them all through their life. God's plans for home was different than that. He has something far better for you than that. He wants your home to be a haven and an oasis, a place you can close the door a place where it's a haven of love between husband and wife and children and they live with a sense of security and a feeling of acceptance and with all the turmoil and violence outside the home, everybody needs some place in life where they can be surrounded by peace and love. God ordained that home. God established it. He gave us a book to tell us how to do a manual. People are going to this type of counselor and that type of counselor. I tell you, there's a book to teach you how to do it. I remember one time I started um, pastoring when I was 24 years old. I worked as a music, music guy at the church uh, before that for a year. And I became pastor in Stillwater, Oklahoma, Oklahoma State University, a lot of college students there. And uh, I was young. I, I had a radio broadcast. And uh, I also had a radio broadcast here in Rhode Island for a while because we couldn't afford to pay it anymore. I was on, had a, so many days a week. But I had a radio broadcast there and it came out on Sunday. 
and you don't know if anybody's listening or not. A lady called me one day, and she told me, she said, would you come to my office? Here I am, she's older than I am. <laughs> uh, she said, would you uh, come to my office? I'd like to meet with you. <clears throat> so I went to her office and found out she was a psychiatrist and a counselor. And she said, I've listened to you on the radio. Amazing. Uh, every Sunday. And she said, I would like to know how to roll. I'll let her for the Lord. <clears throat> that amazed me. She was older than I was. She counseled and advised people. But she was touched, not by me, but by the gospel. You know, a lot of times professional counselors, they are good to give all this advice to other people. They don't always quite carry it out themselves. And I've never forgotten that story, that, that an incident. I thought, there's people in need who counsel other people, advise other people. Yet when it got down to it, she needed to have God. That's the only answer to it. God ordained that home as a place, I said, of emotional safety. And everyone who's married, I think, believes that they want that kind of home. But like I said, it just doesn't happen automatically. It's a result of two things. A proper adjustment to each other, husband and wife, and incorporation into daily life. The principles of marriage are outlined in the Bible. So based on what Joshua says, I think, uh, nextly, there's a time to choose. And I'm struck by his boldness. He made this public. This was a public choice. It wasn't hidden. He made this public disclosure. He said, but as for me, he means I don't care what the rest of you do. I'm going to serve the Lord. Even though he was the leader of a nation, he was willing to part with his own people over this fundamental issue. And I think we will all have to say that sooner or later. Which side are we on? We're trying to straddle the fence. We're trying to appease a wicked world that Christ loves and died for. We ought to care for them like he cares for them, to reach them with the gospel. But we're going to have to make a choice. And he said, choose you this day where you're going to be and what you're going to do and consistently keep at it. It happens to us. We have to choose whether we're office workers, whether we're executives, whether we're business leaders, teachers, students, blue collar workers, or simply dealing with friends and family members or neighbors. It's true of all of us. It makes no difference. And if you serve Christ, there will come a time when you must say, do what you want. Make money all you want to. Fun all you want to. I remember being in high school. I'm not trying to lift myself up. But I'd have other boys, guys say, Strickland is a Christian. You know, he doesn't do certain things. He won't do this. And I said, yeah, I, I certainly am. <laughs> not backing down. <laughs> you know, I, I didn't care what they said. It makes no difference. I went to a secular university, and I had a brother who graduated from the same university before I did. I always liked what he said. He didn't say he said he didn't let going to college interfere with his education. Amen. You get the drift of that. <laughs> I heard more baloney in college than I heard anywhere else most of the time. <laughs> Here I stand. Here we're supposed to stand. Like Joshua did. And I was struck by that because he said it openly. It was a personal decision that he said, as for me. In the end, it comes down to this. You must choose. You must choose which side you're going to be on. We try to travel the fence, it doesn't work that way. 
it won't happen by accident. It can't be inherited from your parents. They give you the heritage, but at some point you have to make it on your own. This was a persuasive declaration. But as for me, he's trying to persuade them. This may be the most amazing thing of all. Here Joshua speaks as God's appointed leader to all these people, as a leader of his family. He claims the right to speak for his wife, his children, his grandchildren, his great-grandchildren, and his own servants. He said, I'm going to speak blankly for all of us. And as, for the, as being part of the leader of this clan, I hold the proxy in my hand. I declare that my entire household will serve a living and true God. Wow. So by the way, they still have clans in the Middle East, and they know who their clans are, and I can't keep up with all that. But now there's millions of them, and they're very tight-knit to their clan and uh, what they did, and many of them become believers, and so they're kind of outcasts from the cl clan, but it still happens today. Not an American phenomenon. This is a persuasive declaration. He said, I'm speaking for all of them. And he said, as in that position, then for us as well, every Christian man ought to make a similar statement about the family that God has given him. It's a very positive statement. We will, he said, serve. We're breaking all this down. He positive that we will serve Lord. This is more than a statement about forsaking other gods, though that's implied. It means that Joshua's family will orient itself around the worship of the God of Israel, and his law will be our law. His commandments will be our delight. His worship, uh, our highest goal, and his glory, our ultimate aim. All people serve something or someone. Who will it be? Can I guarantee you that your children will follow in your steps and serve the Lord you worship? No. The answer is no. Because God gives us each the ability to make our choice. And yeah, you can be in the best home of everything you do and some the children still may not follow you. We all know the sad cases of godly parents produced offspring that did not serve Christ. What does this mean? text mean that it means that it teaches us that godly parents can tip the scale in the right direction. We cannot guarantee what our children will do, but we can provide an atmosphere of serious godliness that makes it easier for the choice to be made as a way that we would want it to be made. Now I realize today I'm speaking about the family, but in reality, I'm speaking to individuals. The message applies to all of us because we need to serve the Lord if we if we plan to serve Him when we're married. Start off with that. Is your mind made up? Are you ready to serve the Lord? Do you know where you stand with God? The application could not be clearer. Choose for yourself this day whom you will serve. You have to serve somebody. No one gets a free ride, and no one can straddle the fence forever. There's no room for neutrality. Every person needs a God, and every person must serve the God they choose. And if you choose not to choose, you've already made a choice. You can't choose a true God by default or by inheritance. However, individual has to make that choice. Make your choice. Cast your votes. Choose your God. I pray you will make the right choice. But he said, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. You can have a happy home. Home's not a place to hang your hat. It's a place to satisfy your heart. It's a place where we don't have to wear a mask and pretend, but where we can be ourselves among people who accept us what we are and love us just the same. A happy home does not depend upon externals, furniture, clothes, swimming pools, things like that. Nothing wrong with that. I've said not what it depends on. It depends on the hearts of the people who live there. 
if your heart right with God. Be kind one another, Paul said in Ephesians 4. Be tender-hearted to one another, forgiving one another, just as God in Christ also has forgiven you. And so we exercise kindness, tenderness, forgiveness, because that's the way God treats us. Here we have a secret of a happy home. God is in our hearts and our homes. He'll make our home a heaven. Yes, it takes a heap of living to make a home, a house a home. It also takes a heap of loving. Love that's kind, is tender, is forgiving. So let's ask God to put that kind of love in our hearts and homes. We'll tell you a story today, a story of a situation that's very common, I'm sure, to many people. A friend of mine who's a pastor in Indianapolis, Indiana, he sent this to me, and I think it's pertinent for what we have been talking about together these last few days. On February 26th of this year, there was a wedding at Thompson Road Baptist Church in Indianapolis. This is the pastor writing. He said, the bride and groom exchanged their vows in a beautiful double ring ceremony witnessed by maybe 125 people on a late winter, early spring day in South Central Indiana that brought cardinals and robins out of their winter nesting places. He said because the bride's father had, was deceased and because, he says, the pastor and his wife had the privilege of leading this couple in Bible studies and discipleship sessions for several months, the bride asked me if I would walk her down the aisle to give her hand in marriage to the waiting groom. He said, of course, it was an honor and I was able to do so proudly because of and the pastor asked this question, who giveth this woman to this man? I said, on behalf of her father and mother, I do. Then I took the front row seat next to my wife and watched the rest of the ceremony. And he said, that's not the story. And he said, as the couple, having joined hand at the altar, sent it onto the platform, it was difficult not to notice there was not a typical wedding party. There were no bridesmaids, no groomsmen, just the bride and groom and the pastor and a PM. And he said the vows were heartrending, profound, Christ exalting, tenderly touching, spoke often through tears or a quivering voice, but he said that's still not the story. said this is. He said the groom was reared in a home where there was little thought given to God, the church, religion, spiritual matters. He became pretty self-sufficient, independent, giving little or no thought to God, and attending and graduating uh, from college with a full ride scholarship, having majored in mechanical engineering, and lived with this motto. If it's so to be, it's up to me. He met, a, he met the truth one day at a Christian retreat in the fall of 2018. And his life was transformed by the Lord Jesus Christ. A friend was instrumental in inviting him and sponsoring his attendance. The bride, she grew up in an Indiana home where there was seldom any mention of God, no encouragement on the part of either parent to seek after God, and not wanting to influence their children in one direction or another. They just let her go. Her father had died when she was 13, and it drove her away from ever wanting to know God, and indeed there was one. She had some tough teen years, then she attended college at a northern Indiana University, majoring in mechanical engineering, before she transferred to Indiana University, majoring in dietetics. Her college years were at best turbulent, 
filled with hedonistic living, hatred toward God. Even though at 2011, the age of 19, she got married. to this groom who was 21 years old. Neither of them had any spiritual training. They had no spiritual foundation for which to build a life, much less a home. And her personal assessment, she said about herself of her life at this point, she said she had a believing sister who prayed for her and had prayed for her for 10 years to come to Christ. She said, my time at Indiana University was tumultuous, damaging. It was devastating to my relationship to my husband. I lived a godless life. I was consumed with feminism. I defied God's natural order of the world. I, did, I defied submission to authority in God and my husband and said, I lived a wicked life. In 2019, her husband had gotten saved. So an intense spiritual retreat in the fall, confirmed atheist, that he began a life-changing pattern that changed forever his life. He said, I was already convinced that there was a God. I was, pardon me, I was already convinced that God was not real. She went ahead and said, I found the Bible confusing and unclear. There seemed to be contradictions and verses I found downright offensive. In my bitterness and hard-heartedness, I was convinced I don't need a Savior anyway. But someone talked to her. Her former husband paid for her way to go a tree. She said, God worked on something in my heart that weekend. He offered me the gift of salvation and repentance. I accepted the Lord Jesus Christ as my Savior. Later, I was baptized. It was a turning point of my life. It was the beginning of life of revelation of truth. She said, the wheels for divorce had already been set in motion between us. We were not strong enough to reverse that forward motion, so the divorce was finalized. And so for the next couple of years, we still kept in communication, but not together. And said she called her husband, former husband, and said, can we get together again? They were married in February 26. Married the first time, July 15, 2011, she 19 and 21. Divorced October 2019, remarried on February 26, 22. It makes me want to shout. <laughs> I read that. I know it's kind of a story. This is what God can do. <clears throat> if you not know Christ today, when Jesus comes, He can make all things new. You don't have to stay in the same rut. You don't have to live the same way. He makes all things new. So that's why there was no groomsmen. That's why there were no bridesmaids. That's why there was nothing else when they got it. They'd already been married once. Now about two and a half years in between, they got married. That's what God can do. He makes all things new. There's a place to start over at. It's in Christ. In Milan, Italy, there is a cathedral, and over the entranceway, there are three doorways into the main part of the cathedral. Over the doorway to the left, there is a carving in the stone of beautiful roses 
full bloom with the saying, all things of beauty are temporal. There's another carving on the doorway to the right. It has a picture of Calvary and Christ dying on the cross. And all the pain and heartache that Christ went through is evident in that carving. With these words, all things of pain are temporary. And in the middle, on the center doorway, no carving, no pictures, all the words. Nothing is, nothing is important but that which is eternal. Makes no difference. Makes no difference about anything else. All that's important is that which is eternal. That's what it says. So, what are you clinging to? Where are you laying up your inheritance? Is your life evidenced by faith? You have a home, like the little girl said. Oh, we have a home. We just don't have a place to put it in. You say, well, of course I have a home. Let me ask you again, with a challenge to think more deeply. You really have a place where you're firmly rooted you're attached, you're loved, you're valued. Many people have a roof over their heads, but they really aren't at home. They're everywhere else. God has a place for us that transcends every earthly location. The Bible said there's a place for us far beyond anything we can design or build. A place that cannot fail, a place that does not disappoint, a place where every man, woman, and child can be truly at home, at peace with self and the world. And that place is the very pers person of God himself at home. God has prepared a home where it will never fade, never die. You'll be there for eternity. This world is not your own. But you can have somewhat of a home like heaven on earth. But the day is coming when you'll have eternal, heavenly home forever. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for this day. We pray that you would help us all to take to heart, I pray that by the power of your spirit that we would respond to the truth and in response to that say as Joshua did that I will and our family will serve the Lord. But we know that as we trust you we have the power to live a new life. So help us all this morning to first of all believe the gospel Lord to believe its promises and then to claim them as our own and then to live them out. Lord, we just pray that you will, in Down City Church, that you will raise up men who show the world what a man is when he's right with God, what a woman is when she's right with God, what a husband <coughs> is when he's right with you, and what a wife is when she is right with you, and what a family is. Lord, we thank you that everything you've called us to do in our life, whatever responsibilities that we have, whatever time period we are in our life, we can do it well through Christ who strengthens us. So, Lord, thank you for this. We pray all these things in your name. Amen. Amen.